can be presenting at LASA, yeah. which is a one of the biggest Latin Americanist conferences. I think it is the biggest. Uh, but the Congress this year is in uh, Lima at the end of the month, so he will be there. I'll be attending as a discussant. But you know, it's good practice to get this uh, to work on your presentation or find it beforehand. I'm presenting next month at another conference, so this is a dry run. So any any questions or concerns or critiques of uh, our presentations, feel free uh, afterwards to share them during the Q and A. Uh, we also wanted to take this moment at the beginning of this conference. Uh, obviously, last week, uh, Ana Maria Bejarano passed away, unfortunately, after a long and very, uh, very brave struggle with cancer uh, at LAS. And I mean, anybody who is in the department at the university who is focused on Latin American studies, you understand what the loss this is. Mm -hmm. I just want to say a couple words because she was my supervisor. Uh, yeah. She was pretty much the reason why I got into I'm at U of T. So. A lot of my colleagues, for example, in the department, when we, you first enter, you have the round table and everybody, all the new uh, students are uh, uh, convened with a, a couple of professors at the head of the department, and you're supposed to introduce yourself. And I remember thinking, you know, when I went around and people were talking about doing their masters at Oxford and Georgetown, very distinguished universities, and I did my bachelor's and master's at CUNY in New York, at Brooklyn College and City College in New York. Uh, it's decent schools, but not of that caliber by any stretch of the imagination. And I applied, I thought it was a long shot to U of T, but I also contacted Ana Maria, and she agreed to be my supervisor. And I think, I really truly feel that's the reason why they accepted me, because they take in 25 students every year out of maybe 500 applications and whatnot. It's very competitive. So if she had said, no, I don't have time, I don't, I don't want to work with this guy, I don't think I would have been accepted. So that changed my life. And she was always, uh, very, uh, many of my colleagues in the department, for example, of supervisors, uh, who are, you know, they just can't leave or get out of their own skin as being academics or professors. And whereas Ana Maria was a brilliant intellect, she was also a brilliant person. She was, I was able to communicate with her when I had personal issues uh, in the last couple of years with, you know, for example, I lost a very close friend of mine, I didn't, didn't want to work with her. It was very difficult for me to get motivated and she understood that and she, she had experienced that herself. And a lot of my colleagues who have uh, supervisors uh, who are more akin to aliens <laughs> for disguised as humans, trying to act like humans, than real people. And they cannot socialize, they cannot connect with these people on any level. So I was able to, I was very fortunate that I was able to do that with Ana Maria. And I think everybody in here had experience in one shape, in some shape or form with her, and you understand what I'm talking about. So, uh, to, uh, I, she wasn't my supervisor, but I had a relationship with her. She was very intelligent, but like you said, she was very uh, giving with her time. She was also somebody who listened to you no matter what. You had ideas, she bounced them off her, and she wouldn't judge you for them. And I think that's really important. It's a quality that I think a lot of academics, fortunately, don't all have. Um, and especially in the position that she was as Latin Americanist here at U of T, uh, it's actually quite a difficult position. It's not easy being a Latin Americanist here. So find, having somebody who understood the struggles of being a, Cana a Latin Americanist at a Canadian university um, was very nice and very refreshing. And somebody who came from Latin America, I think was also very important. Somebody who didn't see it as an object to be studied, but who lived it, who was there, and who understood it in a kind of personal level, which I think was uh, valuable. So her loss is a loss, I think, for us personally, obviously, but also a loss for, for the uh, Canadian academic community in general, because it's hard to get such a high caliber that Latin Americanist in global science to come to Canada. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, her reputation is well deserved, and she's going to be greatly missed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Join me in stand. All right. Well, I think uh, in that, we should celebrate Latin American studies. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go first. Um, as we said, given that Joanna is not going to be participating, uh, that will give us, we don't really have a time frame, I guess, but we're not going to try to extend past 25, 30 minutes each. But that was the, we're going to devote the prior an hour to presentation and an hour to Q&A. Given the, the size of this uh, turnout, I think it'll be a little more informal. And as I said before, uh, this is a dry run for something, uh, a conference I need to present that in a month. So again, it's, it's not crude, but it's, uh, you know, it, it needs work, so to speak. So, uh, Do you, would you yeah, yeah, I was gonna say adjustment, maybe, yeah. for the first Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> 
La tienes que cerrar, no abrir. No, pero tienen que cerrarla, está abierta. No se puede cerrar, como así. Sí. No sé por qué, pero. Ah, oh, ok. Ah. Ahí da. <risa> <risa> exactly. Ahora puede ver. Ya. Ahí te espero. Okay. All right, so the name of my presentation, I'll just quickly present myself to my mom and I'll also be my name is Zach Smith, our PhD candidate here at the University of Toronto in the Doctorate of Science. Uh, the name of my presentation is Landed Elites, as in social networks and state insurgent embeddedness in contested territory, evidence from Colombia. Uh, this effectively, this presentation is a summary of my preliminary research findings. I uh, conducted over 100 uh, field interviews in disparate places in Colombia. Been there almost two years. Uh, so this is all pretty much, at this point, juncture in time. I'm drafting the earliest chapters of my dissertation, but I'm also trying to refine my model to explain my research puzzle. So, what do I do? Uh, it once mentioned how I arrived, how, so I'm obviously not familiar. Uh, how did I arrive at studying this particular project or undertaking this project? And a couple years ago, uh, in my second and third year of the program, I was trying to find a research puzzle for my, my dissertation. And I was constantly looking at maps uh, of Colombia, of various, uh, no, various forms. And then this map, for, uh, for example, is uh, the distribution of, of coca plants uh, throughout Colombia. This one is the, uh, a map regarding criminality. This one regarding the uh, distribution of abandoned land. So one thing that struck me after constantly reviewing these, these disparate maps was the spatial variation in conflict patterns. So uh, in, in simpler terms, how is it that there are municipalities which are heavily afflicted by the armed conflict in every every indicator of violence, per se, endemic level of violence, that are somehow located next to other municip neighboring municipalities, which demonstrate next to no violence, or, or they, they seem at peace, per se. And how is this possible, ostensibly, when the same armed actors are, are in contention in these, these, these disparate, uh, disparate territories? So this led to uh, the, the following research puzzle, uh, research puzzle pardon me. Uh, how is the state able to reclaim control of certain disputed spaces at a subnational and sub-regional context easier than others? So how, when the same actors, for example, from the FARC, from the ELN, which is a nationwide, which are nationwide organizations, yet the state is able to effectively defeat or remove those actors from certain areas easier than others, yet they're from the same group. How, how, how is that possible? But it's also a holistic question because the state is not the only actor. They're competing. It's uh, you need to look at um, all of the repertoires and all of the actors involved. So conversely, that begs the question: How are insurgents able to resist such state expansion efforts? And by state expansion, I generally mean uh, what is popularly known as counterinsurgency. But counterinsurgency is not only a military effort; it also requires state expansion, state construction, so on and so forth. So how is uh, how are insurgents able to resist these efforts in certain places? Uh, whereas in others, they are not. They, they succumb to uh, these counterinsurgency strategies. So my, my, my primary case studies are found uh, in north, northeast, in northern Colombia. One the first is Montes de Maria. It is a region, a sub-region that is comprised of 15 municipalities between the departments of Bolivar and Sucre. Roughly, give or take, as you can see, it's between, uh, it's located between Cincelejo and Cartagena. Uh, my, my other case study is the Department of Arauca, which is located in the Eastern Plains on the border with Venezuela. So in each case study, I focus on three, three municipalities, because in the Colombian context, the best unit of analysis is the municipality. Here, um, I believe in Canada, there's municipalities, and in the U.S., there would be counties, but nevertheless, I focus on three municipalities in Montes de Maria and three municipalities in Arauca. So, it warrants mention as well, 
that the three municipalities that I focus on here are the historic crux of the of the subregion. So here we have San Jacinto, here El Carmen, and here we have Ovejas. So those are my, my three uh, cases in Monte de Maria, in Arauca. My three case studies are Arauca Capital. It's complicated because the name of the department is Arauca. Well, thank you. Uh, how do I do this? Yeah. This here is Arauca Capital. The name of the, uh, the capital, the cabecera of Arauca Capital is Arauca. Mm -hmm. The department is Arauca. So I, I will call it the municipality, I refer to it Arauca Capital. Mm -hmm. And the department is Arauca, and if I refer to the city at all, it would be Arauca City. My second uh, municipality in Arauca is Arauquita here, and then the third is, it, it gets a little complicated with the nomenclature. Uh, this, municipal, uh, this municipality is called Dame. So as you can see, they're, they're connected by... How are they called? Huh? How is, how is it Arauca Capital, no, then, then Arauquita, Dame. Oh, Dame. Oh, Dame. So the, these three here, and those three in Monte de Maria. And as you can see, one is located they're very physically disconnected, obviously. And also, I, I, I should mention that this region, geographically, historically, uh, and ethnically, is much more homogenous uh, than Arauca. This, you can articulate Monte de Maria as one subregion. Arauca, the department, is divided into two subregions. And this is imperative to understanding my research project, the historical configurations and whatnot, but also how the, ter how the territory differs. Uh, the two subregions in Arauca, one is called the Piedmont, Piedemonte in, in, in Spanish. That this here is the eastern cordillera of the Andes, and the the descent, if you will, from here is what is known as the Piedmont. It is this part of Tame, Arauquita, and the municipalities of Saravena and Portul. The rest of Arauca is the plains, La Sabana. Arauca capital is is plains. Caravo Norte is another municipality, it's also Plains, Puerto Rondon here, and this part of Tame. This is extremely important in understanding the ability of insurgents and the state in, uh, in claiming hegemony in these, these disparate territories. So, you know, the $64,000 question, there's a lot of, uh, many areas of Colombia which are afflicted by, by armed conflict where from non-state actors reign supreme. There's illicit economic networks. The state does not maintain a an authoritative presence. So why did I select these two particular case studies? Well, in reality, they were selected for me. In 2002, when uh, ex-president Uribe came to power on the on the back of the failed uh, Kawan peace negotiations, uh, he was elected with a, on the policy of mano dura that he was going to take the fight to the guerrillas in the disparate regions of the country. Within one month of taking power, in 2002, I believe it was August or September, he selected these two regions to be laboratories for his counterinsurgency strategy, which is known as uh, democratic security. A very interesting title indeed. Uh, so he selected these two regions specifically because they were perceived as being guerrilla havens. Right? So historically speaking, in Arauca and Monte de Maria, uh, various guerrilla groups had maintained a formidable presence. In Arauca, it has been divided between the ELN and the FARC. So the ELN's front there is arguably the ELN's strongest front in all of Colombia. It's called Domingo Lai. Mm -hmm. FARC uh, maintains two fronts in Arauca. One is the 10th and one is the 45th front. Monte de Maria similarly has presence, or historically had a presence, of the ELN, primarily in San Jacinto at El Carmen. It was called I made Ateman uh, Cayón, was the, the name of the front. Park similar, similar to Arauca, also maintained two fronts in Monte de Maria, the 37th and 35th front. The ones mentioned as well, whereas in Arauca, historically, the ELN Park have maintained a certain parity of power vis-a-vis uh, -vis one another. Whereas in Monte de Maria, Park, once they arrived, after the other, uh, these smaller guerrilla groups were already present, they, they became the hegemons. They became the powerhouse, the, uh, the insurgent powerhouse in the, in the region. So ELN could never really compete with the FARC in Monte de Maria. Similarly, there were also numerous other smaller guerrilla groups, such as the ERP, PRT, EPL, CRS, and MIR Libre. The majority of these, apart from the ERP, demobilized uh, with the new constitution and the peace process from 1991, 1994. Uh, similarly, Uribe targeted these areas not because uh, not only because there, were, uh, there was a massive guerrilla presence, but also due to the presence of illicit economic networks. 
So as you can see here, any form of illegality that you can possibly think of existed in Arauca and Montezumania. They were seen as beyond, completely beyond the control of the state, and as such, that that's one of the uh, reasons why they were both targeted. Uh, similarly, both regions, with the massive uh, nationwide paramilitary expansion, which began in 1995-1996 with the uh, umbrella, with the establishment of AUC, uh, both of these regions experienced paramilitary incursions. In Arauca, this came later than most other regions of Colombia, from 2001 to 2005. There was a massive mil uh, paramilitary push, and the group there was known as Bloque Vencedores de Arauca. Similarly, in Montes de Maria, there was a massive paramilitary intervention, but this started slightly earlier in 1999 and lasted until 2005. The group there was known as Bloque Heroes de Montes de Maria. And as always, as everywhere else in the country, the paramilitaries existed in, uh, their, uh, in a symbiotic relationship with the Colombian military. Right? For example, I've interviewed ex paracos in different regions of the country, and they always said the same thing. Them, they referred to the military as primos. The military, military referred to paracos as primos. You know, and this is something you find a different. It was very they colluded uh, in regards to everything, uh, but there's a variation uh, at the local level depending on the paramilitary bloc. Mm -hmm. So the main difference, though, between these two regions, apart from historical and cultural factors, is the outcomes. So Uribe established the same counterinsurgency strategy in both these regions at the same time. Mm -hmm. In 2002, both of them, prior to Uribe, were considered or perceived throughout Colombia in political circles, <coughs> military circles, uh, academic circles, as being guerrilla havens, insurgent havens. You can see here, there's some headlines, there's some quotes from field interviews about the level of uh, guerrilla influence in these regions. Uh, one is from Arauca, the other is from Monte de Maria. However, by the end of Uribe's first term in office in 2006, uh, in the uh, Araucan plains, in places like the, the plains region in Dame, Arauca capital, the, both the FARC and the ELN had been effectively defeated or removed. They either went to Venezuela or they went to the Piedmont. Okay. Similarly, by 2007, the leadership, Martin Caballero, the Comandante of the FARC in, in Monte de Maria, was assassinated in a targeted bomb. After that, all the guerrillas left. Mainly uh, the ELN, for example, and ERP had left prior, give or take around 2003, 2004, but the FARC all but abandoned the region. So you can take a look at this strategy as being successful in Monte de Maria. Uh, the plains, similarly, the guerrillas, as I just mentioned, were pushed out. The Piedmont, however, things actually got worse with this strategy. And as you, if you take a look at the third, uh, what's the pointer? This quote here, this is from maybe 10 days ago, mm -hmm. where in Portugal, in the Piedmont, a subcommand, uh, subcommander from the police was assassinated. This is extremely, this is common, very, very common. Mm -hmm. Arauca remains arguably the most heavily guerrilla consolidated zone. So the same strategy was employed by the Colombian military under Uribe in conjunction with resources provided by the United States through Plan Colombia. As you can see though, the outcomes here are dramatically different. So I have a couple scatter plots here, I'll just quickly go through them, but if you take a look, this is from 1998. Uh, the bottom axis, there are violent actions initiated by armed non-state actors, and the x-axis uh, are homicides. So these two here, Oveja San Jacinto, this little cluster here is pretty much, I would say, where you find the, the average Colombian municipality at this juncture of time. Mm -hmm. This is Tame, so it's obviously not, uh, you know, it would be an intermediate status, if you will. This is El Carmen, Arauca Capital, Arauquita. These three are amongst the worst in terms of order and stability in all of Colombia in 1998. Mm -hmm. 2002, the year that we became the power. Wow. Oh. Ove, uh, Ovejas and San Isidro are still in this cluster here, so they're, I would say they're afflicted, but not nearly as badly as El Carmen, the other municipality in Monte de Maria that I'm focusing on. Arauquita, this is clearly a critical security stage. Arauca Capital is probably arguably the worst municipality in the entire country, and Tame is, is in contention as well. <laughs> so, 2006, we have the end of Uribe's first, uh, first term. So he's been, in, uh, he's been in power for four years. He's implemented his strategy, consolidated to a certain degree. As we find here, Arauca Capital, which was the worst four years prior, has been stabilized. Ovejas, San Jacinto are in the same bracket where they've always been. 
El Carmen, Araujita, and Dame are amongst the worst. Finally, 2010. These three municipalities are the, the municipalities I focus on, Ponte de Maria. So you can see they've been pacified, or they seemingly have been pacified. There's extremely low levels of violence. Arauca Capital has regressed a little, but nevertheless, it's still better than it was eight or 10 years prior. Araujita and Dame remain some of the worst municipalities in the country. So out of the four, you can see that this policy, uh, democratic security, it has achieved, or seemingly achieved some success in pacifying four of these, these six municipalities in question. So for me, my primary variable or explanation to uh, how this, this uh, variation exists is what I term, well, what, not what I term, what's uh, termed in the literature as embeddedness. Well, what is embeddedness? There's various concepts and various strains of uh, political science literature ranging from explaining diaspora economic groups to uh, the, the, the strength of municipal government, per se. Uh, I borrow two quotes here from prominent works on this concept of indebtedness. As we see with the first one, granted it is a seminal work, the role of concrete personal relations and structures or networks, networks is key, of such relations in generating trust and discouraging malfeasance. Right? Uh, for Moody and White, embeddedness indicates that actors who are integrated in dense clusters of multi multiplex relations of social networks face different sets of resources and constraints than those who are not embedded in such networks. So, while this has been applied in various strains of, of the uh, in political science and social science literature, there, not, there does not exist a convincing explanation how is embeddedness really generated, and how do these dense networks just emerge seemingly you know, effortlessly in certain contexts, whereas in others there's this practically uh, extremely low levels of embeddedness. What you would term anomie? What, what anomie? Oh, the, the term yeah, yeah, yeah. French, no? Yeah, I got it. Anomie in, in Spanish. So, I have established a tentative model here to explain how embeddedness is formed, spe specific to the context in which I am uh, studying here. So I take what my first variable would be what I term uh, historical residues. I brought this from James Robinson. Historical residues really, uh, it's the social historic evolution of, of institutions, if you will, or you know, within a given context, a specific context. The second variable, which arrives, which effectively grasps itself onto historical residues, is insurgent integration. Both of these factors combined determine, in a given context, peasant insurgent relations, and that in turn determines embeddedness. So that's my explanation. It's not the most complicated thing in the world, but you know, I'm trying it. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, right. So the first variable I was uh, that, that I mentioned is historical residues the social historical evolution of a given community, a, a given territory. Uh, I'll explain how these manifest themselves in the different subregions in question. Because it's, there's no point describing the uh, historical residues of each municipality because certain ones are quite similar to others. So I've grouped together uh, in my case studies in different regions, subregions. So yeah, Aralcan Plains, the Piedmont, and Monte de Marie. I think those are fairly homogeneous units of analysis that I can't compare. So the historical residues, as you see here, would be the, the plains. I interviewed an ex-ELN uh, militant in both. I was now an academic uh, slash researcher at Think Tank. And he described the plains as such. There has been a feudal model since the 17th century that the Jesuits brought. The elites are clearly defined and are composed of, of the ranch owners. Large cattle ranchers and latifundistas, all of whom measure their wealth in cattle and hectares. So the Piedmont was described by a public servant to me, who I interviewed in Arauca Capital, as being, there are no large landholders. The distribution of land was planned by Incora, which was a government land titling agency established in the late 1960s to uh, help direct the colonization of various uninhabited places throughout Colombia, and was directed by local peasants. It is a model peasant economy. Monte de Maria, the concentration of land is very high and in few hands. The large landholders lend land to peasants to cultivate and don't collect rents. However, the peasants can only sell their crops to their landlord, uh, landlords. This was a peasant organizer in El Carmen. So, the impact of how this land was settled ultimately determines the social hierarchies which emerge in these regions. So, in the Aralcan Plains and Montes de Maria, the social hierarchies which emerged as a product of these, these dynamics, the land settlement, are vertical. At the top, if you will, these would be the ganaderos, uh, people with 
cattle ranches with massive, massive extensions of land. In turn, there's a small intermediate class of people, Maya Gomos, who they hire to administer the lands, to organize all of the, the, uh, the, 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 the workers who are hired seasonally, to drive cattle, for example, to take care of the animals, to you know, chop wood, do all the, uh, the petty work. These are the majority. They are land poor peasants who are entirely dependent upon this highly stratified class, this land, land, holding, land holding class, pardon me. Uh, on the other hand, in the Araku Kedmont, what emerged, given that the, major, the land was settled by colonos, uh, internal colonizers, if you want, who were given small, small tracts of, uh, of land, up to 28 hectares or 30 hectares, not much, to engage in subsistence farming. As long as they cleared the land and settled it themselves, they were granted a title by Inqua, by the Colombian government. As a result, there were no, there were no elites in the, in the social dynamic. There were no local elites whatsoever. And given the fact that they had to sell these lands on their own, through their own blood, sweat, and tears, whatever, however you want to describe it, this forged ma extremely strong relations between uh, the settlers in this region because they needed one, there was no effective state institutions, they needed, depended on one another to survive. So therefore, the emergent social dynamic in the Piedmont was multiplex. It warrants mention too, the, war, the, the main modes of production, as I mentioned in the plains, was obviously cattle ranching. Cattle ranching is conducive to large land holding, so it, 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 it lends itself to these vertical social structures. Uh, subsistence farming is obviously more inclined to produce multiplex social dynamics. Uh, Montes de Maria is complex in the sense that uh, it depends on what village you go to, but people engage in different forms of, of uh, agriculture, if you will. But the main crop which, uh, which characterized Montes de Maria and its subsequent uh, social dynamic was tobacco. In the mid-19th century, there was a massive tobacco boom, and Montes de Maria became the largest producer of tobacco, mm -hmm. all for export elsewhere. The, this massive growth of uh, tobacco production also generated a dynamic that was much more conducive to a vertical social structure. As you'll see in the next slide too, another factor which, lend, uh, which you need to con uh, take into consideration to understand historical residues are uh, the origins of the peasantry themselves. So as I mentioned prior in the plains, or in, uh, as was mentioned in that specific quote, it was settled by Jesuit missionaries in the 17th century and also Criollos who were subjects of the crown, but they were born, they were native to Colombia and they were not from, from Spain. There was also a, in the, the plains a small number of nomadic indigenous tribes, hunter-gatherer societies, which were eventually displaced and decimated, as to be expected if you understand history and wealth in the world. There was also a small European uh, merchant class which, which arrived. Largely they uh, were, uh, had arrived from the Orinoco in Venezuela and mm. they, arrived upriver and they decided to settle in the plains, mainly around Arauco Capital. Uh, and finally, Venezuelans. Obviously it's a border region and there were large uh, Venezuelan cattle ranchers who owned thousands and thousands of uh, hectares on both sides of the border. All that separates them is a river, a medium-sized river. So there's a Venezuelan influence to this day, a very heavy Venezuelan influence in Arauca, I mean in the plains, well, I mean, throughout the entire department, to be honest. The Piedmont, on the other hand, as I said, pr uh, prior to the 1950s was jungle. It was very highly uninhabited. <coughs> there was no effective uh, state presence there whatsoever. And there was a small number of indigenous tribes. The, uh, tribes, the main one being the Uwa, who were more sedentary. And they're, they're still there to this day, mainly in Saravena, but they're a heavily organized tribe. They're much different than the, the indigenous tribes which inhabited the plains. Partly because you're actually in the cave you're able to cultivate uh, many more subsistence crops, whereas in the plains, it's more conducive to cattle ranching. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the Piedmont was largely settled by internal refugees who were fleeing La Violencia of the 1940s and 1950s. And the majority of which came from neighboring departments such as Santander, Norte de Santander, and Boyacá. Uh, this is important to note because these individuals arrived as a product of state-led violence under the conservative regime in the 1950s. So they were naturally inclined to have its, uh, a serious mistrust of the state that was unable to protect them. And you know, La Violencia produced more than 200,000 uh, casualties in a period of maybe five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it was largely partisan. So those regions, the aforementioned regions, Santander, Santander, Boyacá, were liberal. 
way felt more conservative. But nevertheless, anybody who was perceived as being liberal, as entire towns were back then, were ransacked, massacred, and for forcibly displaced by conservatives and their, their auxiliaries. So this is very, uh, it's crucial to explaining their eventual mistrust of the state, yet the level of abandonment when they arrived in the Piedmont also uh, forced them to, to make demands from local and national level authorities for basic services so that they could, they could survive. Health clinics, there was you know, epidemics of malaria, yet the, the, as I mentioned before, the state presence there was never, uh, purely never really existed until oil was discovered in Arauca's apartment in the 1980s. Finally, the, the peasant origins in Monte de Maria, it was similar to the Arauca plains, was settled during the colonial era uh, by Palenques, who were runaway African slaves, mainly from Cartagena and its surrounding area. Monte de Maria is characterized by low, low hills, mainly like between 400 and 800 meters. So it, it, it's 50 to 100 kilometers away from Cartagena, and they established their, their refuges in these hills. Similarly, Rochelas, who were poor mestizos, were also fleeing from Spanish authorities. They settled in as refuge. There was a small number of indigenous uh, tribes as well. But with the tobacco boom in the mid-19th century, European merchants arrived to serve as middlemen and buying agents, and they effectively, within a generation, turned themselves into the land, uh, the land elites of the region given that their economic status. So for example, in places, uh, you hear about these big families who own massive tracts of land in Monte de Maria, and they're still there to this day. But they have last names such as Cohen, mm -hmm. which are clearly not very uh, Colombian or even Latin last mm -hmm. names. Mm -hmm. But that is, they, they, they were converted into the, the landed elites of the region, the tobacco world. Mm -hmm. So that encapsulates what I refer to as historical residues. Insurgent integration here, uh, if you see the following questions, it refers to uh, how the, the, the insurgents arrived to the region and how they embed themselves into local peasant communities. Right. Well, some key differences in, uh, amongst my case studies regarding insurgent arrival and conduct, I've elucidated from my, my field research. <laughs> okay, it's terms I know. But the sequencing of arrivals is crucial. So both the ELN and FARC arrived in the Piedmont, the Iraqi Piedmont, uh, before, prior to the discovery of oil in the early 1980s. Okay. And this discovery of oil obviously facilitated a massive state military expansion into the part of, uh, of Arauca. The importance of this is that in, in, in the Piedmont, that the insurgent social development policy, their program, was heavily tied to subsistence farming. And the arrival of oil disrupted this dramatically, which only further, the, uh, further drove the insurgents and the peasants into one another's arms, so to speak. Whereas these uh, insurgents from the same uh, fronts of the Elan and the FARC expanded into the plains slightly after the discovery of oil. And in the plains uh, for time memorial, the, the economic basis has been cattle ranching, which was not very conducive to peasant organizing. These peasants were entirely dependent on large landholders. Therefore, their program of reappropriation and uh, redistribution, the peasants were unable, they were unable to gain traction with the local peasants. And they also promptly started extorting the large landholders, which only created further tensions within uh, these communities. So, similarly, in Monte de Maria, the arrival of smaller insurgent groups in the 1980s. Uh, most of the smaller groups, as I uh, previously mentioned, the ERP, CRS, M MIR Libre, uh, EPL, they arrived in the early to mid 1980s. But this is at least 130 years after the, the local political economy was entirely dominated by the production of tobacco for export. Therefore, similar to, to, to the plains, they were unable to grant and gain traction among the local peasantry for this reason. And also they created uh, very dangerous enemies in the large lands of the class with their program of redistribution, uh, extortion, vacunas, the whole night. So the second series of questions, I'll answer that shortly in the next, in the final two slides here. But the other crucial question here uh, between these disparate regions is where did the insurgents come from, their composition? So the insurgencies in Monte de Maria and the Arauca plains the commanders were, they were foreign to the region. Whereas the, the rank and file, there were members who were recruited locally. They were very rarely operationalized in the same communities they were from. 
So what does this ultimately mean? Well, that means that their ability to A, embed themselves, and their access to information sources, and their ability to monitor local communities, which is crucial to any armed actor who wishes to survive in a, in a, given, uh, a given territory, they were, they were substantially limited. Whereas, yeah, at Alcum Cave Mods, the, the first uh, pregenitor class of ELN commanders, they were colonists, they were colonizers before they actually became guerrillas. So they were, they were native to the communities in which they operated. Similarly, the second generation, third generation uh, command structures of the ELN and the Cave Mods, they're all from Arauca. Down to the, the militiamen, everybody is from the, the Cave Mods. Therefore, they all frequently operate in the communities where where they're from. Obviously, their access to information, their ability to monitor is substantially higher. And in turn, the, the civilian population is, is entirely cognizant of this. So they, the, the idea of defecting to the states, paramilitaries, any other, effectively going against the established order is nonsensical. Nobody would dare even think about it because they understand what the reprisals would be. They would be discovered very quickly and it would mean almost certain death for themselves or their families. So the FARC, on the other hand, in the Piedmont, uh, they were invited, so they were imported, if you will, mm -hmm. but they were invited by the local communist parties, which are already established in places like Dame and Aroquita. So therefore, their ability to penetrate local peasant communities was substantially higher. Mm -hmm. On the final two slides, how much of the time? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna discuss briefly how this level of embeddedness between peasants and insurgents manifested itself in the Piedmont and how it manifested uh, itself in the Arauca Plains and Monte de Maria. So how did the convergence of historical residues and insurgent integration lead to exceptionally high levels of insurgent embeddedness amongst the peasantry in the Piedmont? Well, given that most insert, as I've just mentioned, most of the insurgent commanders, soldiers, militiamen in the rural and urban parts of the Piedmont hail from these very communities, from the same Verena where they were born, they maintain a daily presence, whether they're dressed in a uniform or whether they're dressed as a civilian. Mm -hmm. So once again, their level of monitoring is quite high. And it, it, it uh, prevents defection to the state in any shape or form, which is necessary if the state is to embed itself and expel any armed actor from a given territory. Similarly, whereas the ELN or the FARC have never built a school or health clinic or paved the rural road in the Piedmont, they were able to coerce oil companies and local contractors into doing such deeds for them. They would effectively tell them, take your bulldozer, bulldozer clear this pathway, uh, establish a road, or you know, we're gonna seize, we're gonna appropriate your equipment, or we'll kill you, and it worked. Yeah. Okay. Similarly, which is very interesting in the Piedmont, these uh, insurgent organizations organized the peasantry to mobilize collectively via protests, palo civicos, marches, occupations, to demand public goods from local authorities mm -hmm. and national level authorities. Uh, as such, I've been all through, uh, pretty much every region there is in Colombia, I, I, I've been in some shape or form. And I've never seen the level of social uh, civil society as dense as exists in the Piedmont. It is quite impressive. For example, if you read De Tocco when he first went to the United States and talked about uh, local participation, civic participation, or, uh, other authors have, have written on this phenomenon. The, the Piedmont is, is highly impressive, and this is due to the colonizing experience and the peasant origins, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, both the ELN and the FARC co-opted local civil society and all governance positions in, in the Piedmont. So any elections from local municipal councils to the HACS, uh, uh, to the governorships. These elections in, the, uh, in Arauca, due to the influence of the uh, insurgents in the Piedmont, are effectively elections between a FARC candidate and an ELN candidate. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean? Well, they're able, if they are able to co-opt local, from the local municipal council, to local uh, chapters of ANUC or the ACA, which are nationwide peasant organizations, this gives them, gives them more access to a heavy stream of information, because these, these organizations exist at the local level, the micro level. So they have information on everything that goes on in these communities. Therefore, if you co-opt them, you are able to further monitor and exercise what is termed populational control. So even if you don't have territorial control because the state has come in, uh, it has intervened and established bases here, here, and here, populational, uh, pop populational control prevents defection to the state, which is key to peasant survival in the, in the context of capital insurgency. 
Uh, furthermore, by co-opting local uh, local offices, such as local mayoral deeds, the governorship, because it's an oil-producing department, there are, there's a high level of oil rents from that industry that are allocated to the department. So these candidates who are very uh, subtly uh, allied with either the ELN or the FARC are able to divert these funds or decide how they will employ, be employed, satisfy local constituencies. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, Piedmont uh, insurgents, a key factor, a key public good that they provided is security. So they were able to prevent, in the Piedmont, the, the entrance of the, the paramilitary group, they established a security code, their high level of population of control was able to quickly locate any foreigners to these communities who were summarily executed. So, the key here is that the guerrilla, can, uh, that they protected their constituents, which did not occur elsewhere in the country. Uh, a common refrain you hear in the Piedmont, uh, when interviewing disparate people who don't know one another, was thank God for the guerrillas. And that's something, if you heard that in Bogota, people would look at you as if you had three heads. However, the, no, they, 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 they openly say thank God for the guerrillas, because if it wasn't for them, the Paracos would have come in here and massacred us all. So as you see, though, in the case of uh, the Plains and Montes de Maria, the insurgents did not prevent the, the, the paramilitary incursions, which resulted in massive, massive levels of violence against the civilian population who they, support, uh, they purportedly protected. So my final slide, embedding this in the you know, Arauco Plains and Montes de Maria. Within Monte de Maria, it's the level of, of embeddedness really depends, to be honest, on the micro level. So one village, uh, the insurgents may have had a bit more heavily encrusted in those, those uh, social dynamics, whereas others, they were only there fleeing. However, generally speaking, in both the plains and Monte de Maria, the insurgents maintain a moderate level of embeddedness. So for example, any rural enclave where I conducted field, field work, which was stigmatized by the military and paramilitaries alike as being guerrilla havens, they, they share a, a similar narrative in terms of uh, the interactions, the level of interactions with the insurgents who were embedded in their communities. Places like Caracol, which is in Arapa Capital, near, near the Venezuelan border, Chengue, which is in Ovejas, El Salao, which is in El Carmen. Uh, all of these, these, these interviewees said the same thing, that the, the guerrillas only ever really transited. They maintained camps nearby, and they would transit through a couple times a week, maybe, or information and supplies. Nothing more, nothing less. And in terms of public goods, they never provided anything, they never built a school, they never compelled anybody to build a school, a health clinic, they never, never paid the road. The only thing they maintained in terms of a public good for these communities was order. So if somebody went and stole somebody's cow or somebody's animal, you know, somebody stole a gallina or whatever, <laughs> the insurgents, when they came to town, they would uh, assemble uh, some sort of justice. It would often be, you know, a, a summary trial, and if the person was found guilty, which was almost always certain, they were executed. Oh. So, effectively, the only thing provided was order. Any other uh, public good, no, they, they never provided any semblance mm -hmm. of these goods in the Plains or Monte de Maria. Uh, so any civil society organizations that existed in the Plains or Monte de Maria were not effectively valued by the peasantry in the same way that they were in the Piedmont. And there was not nearly the same level of civic participation or the existence of these organizations, these, these dense webs of civil society organizations, uh, associations, unions, uh, the whole variety which exist in the Piedmont were not found in these other regions. Similarly, when the insurgents arrived and attempted to co-opt the, these, these organizations, and the, the leaders frequently refused, and in which case the guerrillas assassinated them. Okay. This led to a massive decline in participation. Subsequently, everybody in Monte de Maria, similarly in the Plains, did the same thing. At once one civil society leader was assassinated, participation dropped to non-existent levels. So there was really very little in terms of uh, these networks for the insurgents to cling to when they arrived in these regions. Uh, similarly, politics in Monte de Maria in the Plains, the insurgent organizations promoted an abstention. So if there was an election, they would force people to not vote. So if people did vote, they would often seize the, the ballot boxes and burn them for whatnot. 
They also banned political campaigning in their areas of influence. So frequently, local level politicians, departmental politicians were assassinated for what they termed politicizing in these rural enclaves. And finally, as I previously mentioned, in the case of the Piedmont, these communities were often heavily stigmatized by the military and the paramilitaries. For example, certain towns were labeled as being you know, FARC towns or ELN towns. And often this stigma was unfair because the local peasantry had no choice if the insurgents decided to establish a camp next to the town. If they tried to refuse, often there were a, a few selective assassinations, and after that, nobody complained anymore. However, when the paramilitary paramilitaries made incursions into these towns to eliminate the, the supposed guerrilla social cases, frequently the guerrillas were either unable or unwilling to actually defend their constituents who they supposedly protected. So this was the case in many, uh, many of the most famous massacres which occurred in Colombia, such as the one in Chengue or El, El Salao, when uh, first the military arrived and pushed back or repelled uh, any insurgents who might have possibly been present. Frequently, they often went and hid in their camps or it drove them even further away from the towns. After the military left, the paramilitary showed up. And frequently were put in informers who would point out schools and uh, collaborators of the guerrillas. Mm -hmm. And these massacres, if you if you study Colombia, were spectacularly brutal. The worst forms of violence I've, I've ever heard of. For example, in Jenge, the informer pointed out 27 men who supposedly uh, sympathizes with the, with the bar, and they didn't want to cause any, uh, cause any commotion, because they, they, they thought that the park were nearby, so they didn't want to shoot anybody, because this would raise their, uh, get their attention. Mm. So they used a pison, oh. which is a flattening, uh, you know, when you go to the countryside in Latin America, often people have, um, uh, you know, patios or whatever next to their houses or the flat dirt. Mm -hmm. So they brought the men one by one to the main stone and the main plaza, and they crushed their, cut their heads. The mm -hmm. So this level of this level of violence occurred, and subsequently, when the uh, guerrillas returned for the first time, following subsequent to these massacres, the local populations completely rejected them because they were stigmatized as being collaborators, even though they weren't. They had no choice in the matter, and the least these insurgents organized, for example, in the Piedmont, they prevented the paramilitaries from entering and committing the same level of abuses, whereas. In the plains and uh, in Monte de Maria, the peasant, local peasants were effectively paying the price for having the insurgents nearby. And this actually drove many of them to collaborate with the state, because they knew the only way that they would ever be left alone, period, is if the guerrillas were effectively removed from that territory. So I think I've over, yeah, I've gone on long enough. I'm going to call it quits there. If you have any questions, feel free after Nico presents. Mm. I don't know what happened to the pizza. I've sort of like been looking at it and they... Maybe they, they knew that there weren't that many people. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. But still, you know, it's odd. Do you want to parar un poquito? Yeah, yeah. Okay, gracias. Sí. Very young. Sí, sí. Sí, que cosa. Yours is a bit more colorful.
then I will transit to my main arguments. And the most complicated part of the presentation, the typology of corporatism, so bear with me. Uh, seven, my explanatory model, and then eight, the conclusion. Mm -hmm. So I have two things here. I have a research motivation, which I would argue is my first order questions or my normative concerns. And then research questions which are dealing with empirical questions which are second order. So the first question I asked myself when I started writing this dissertation is, are labor unions in developing countries viable with globalization and rapid technological change? Mm -hmm. If they are, how can we design labor institutions that are both inclusive and democratic? So these are the two normative concerns that I have in my project. My research questions are the following, and these are, are there cases where unions have grown in the global south in the context of new globalization? Second, how do different labor institutions influence the inclusiveness and representativeness of labor unions? And then third, what impacts do these institutions, the ones I refer to here, have on collective bargaining? So, the why study labor unions? Well, these are the normative considerations as to why we should study labor unions. Um, Hayter describes very well that the purpose of the unions, and I think this is intuitive, I think most people understand this, but it's worth repeating. The labor unions provide a balance to capital. It provides a balance to business, and it allows workers to defend their interests in terms of uh, conditions of work and wages. Um, and as Hayter notes, uh, collective bargaining is the mechanism by which this is done. And in particular, collective bargaining with strong unions um, allows for the share of productivity to be shared widely. Mm -hmm. So this promotes equity, stability in employment relations, and advances social justice, which I think most people probably think is a good thing. <laughs> um, and as we know in the West, in the developed world, labor unions have been on the retreat for the past 30 years, which obviously means that these variables are not doing very well. Um, Another reason is that labor unions are actually historically shown to be very positively correlated with democracy itself. And what labor unions do is that they provide workers with the ability to defend democracy. As Ruschmeyer, Stevens, and Stevens notes, labor unions are, quote, critical for the promotion of democracy. And the reason why is because obviously the first people who are often the victims of authoritarian regimes are workers and the unions themselves. So they have a vested interest in allowing for freedom of association, freedom of expression, and to um, have yeah, uh, an equal voice, or at least some voice, in the uh, distribution of productivity in a society. So what are the empirical considerations? Well, there are a number. The first one is from Roderick, a recent paper. He notes that many developed country, developing countries experience what he calls premature deindustrialization, meaning that these countries are not rich but unfortunately, the way that technology is advancing at such a rapid pace, these countries cannot compete, and therefore their industries are beginning to be, constitute a lower share of their GDP than historically in developed countries. So this is a question. If you have lower rates of industrialization in a country, then you would also expect, as a corollary, lower rates of unionization, because unions are generally strongest in, in industries. Um, I'm, I can't pronounce her name, but as the guy, and Baccaro argue, and an addendum to this, that the growth in unionization and collective bargaining quote, would, own, would, have, would have to involve basically the return of a Fordist type accumulation regime. So if you know what Ford, Fordism is, it's basically a situation where labor relations are very strongly established, where workers have permanent contracts, where they have very discrete tasks, and the uh, employer cannot easily switch workers from one task to another. And therefore, unions are very easily able to determine the conditions of work as a result. Right? So uh, um, the alternative to the Fordist regime has been just-in-time production, the Japanese model, where workers work in teams and they are very flexible to move around. And so supposedly unions find this very difficult to incorporate. Um, and the final thing, and a very academic and empirical question, is why interest um, why class interests are manifested differently across na cross national, right? So, like, the you may you may have two cases. Let's just say let's call the movie White Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> you may have two cases where they're very similar. Mm -hmm. They have very similar socioeconomic. I'll show you this in a second. Very similar socioeconomic background, 
very similar cultural background. But the difference, as you'll see, is that their outcomes are not the same. And so what's causing this? Mm -hmm. And Thelen and Steinmo are asked this question, and so do I. And I'm interested to know, well, why is the observed variation uh, different? And I'll get to the observed variation in a second. Before I get there, though, I'll discuss my methodology quickly. My meta-theoretical framework is historical institutionalism. So what I posit, agreeing with Palin and Steinmo, is that institutions are very important to determine how those class uh, interests are manifested differently in different contexts. And so, as they say, conflict over institutions lay bare the power, uh, interests and power relations in society, which I agree with the premise. And second, that broad policy trajectories can follow from institutional choices. So institutional choices made at one point, time A, for example, will have different results in time two. The question is, how were those, why, were, why were those institutions designed the way they were in the first period? And what if unintended or intended consequences they have in the second period? Right? And so this is what I'm interested in. My method of inference is part process tracing, which means that I take history seriously, and as a result, I look very closely at making sure that the temporal line is consistent and that you can actually show that the evidence follows from one point to the other. Right? So time A leads to time B, time C, and that you can follow back. So that's how you test. Uh, my, um, my, my data collection is uh, semi-structured interviews with elites in the region, which included labor leaders, politicians, bureaucrats, and researchers. Um, I did archival work. Um, I extensively use local primary and secondary sources, newspapers in particular, and I also use statistical data. So my research methodology is what we call mixed methods. I use both. Um, and this is my case selection. So why Argentina and Uruguay? So first off, they're small end case studies, meaning that they're, 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 they can't be compared uh, uh, in terms of a regression because there's not enough variation, there's not enough observations. But they are, I look at the cases not as just two observations, I look at the cases as multiple observations because I look at them over time. So because I'm looking at Argentina and Uruguay over time, it's more than just two observations multiple observations. And the reason why this is the case is that Uruguay and Argentina both had period of democracy authoritarianism. Democracy authoritarianism. And so this obviously leads to more observations, right? Because we're not talking about the same regime over time. The one thing that's interesting, well, I'll actually get that to that in a second. Uh, they are the most similar case study designs as well, meaning that uh, many of the potential independent variables are so similar that they are likely not the cause of the variation I'm interested in. But there is one difference that I think is very different, uh, sorry, very interesting, and I say is causing the variation that I'm interested in, and I'll get to that in a second. So here you'll see some of the most important independent variables that should be able to explain the, the variation I'm looking at. Um, their per capita income is almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Their industry is percent of GDP is almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Their persons per capita, which is my, which is my way of um, determining the size of the, so one of the critiques, sorry, that I that I face in my uh, research is that, well, Argentina is so much bigger than Uruguay, right? How can you compare that? I think that's a bad way of looking at it, because you want to look instead at the question of how many people live per square kilometer in terms of density, right? So obviously, if you have a country that, that has 100 people per square kilometer, it's not comparable to a country that has 14, right? But these two countries do have very similar uh, densities, which I think is one way of looking at uh, size differently and much more uh, contextually. Their Gini index are also very similar, meaning that they have very similar levels of inequality. They, they're very important, the qualitative similarity is that they have collective bargaining at the sector level. So this is, uh, labor, uh, labor terms are not very commonly known, so I'll have to explain what that means. So collective bargaining, I assume everyone knows what that means. It means when business, when unions and business um, collaborate and discuss over the conditions of work and salaries. What makes these countries unique is that the agreements signed between labor unions and signed between business apply to all workers in a sector. What that means is, what that means is, is that when a union signs a contract with business and the state, you that particular contract applies to all workers independent of the <laughs> Okay, 
So what this means is that when a contract is signed between business and a labor union, that particular contract applies to all workers in the sector, independent of whether or not they're part of the union. Okay? So that means the contract signed between union A and business and business organization A applies to you whether or not you pay the union or not. Okay? Here in North America, in Canada, for example, the collective bargaining occurs at the firm level. What that means is that the collective bargaining agreement between the union and the business only applies to that particular business. It doesn't apply to all university workers. Doesn't apply to, I think teachers have sector level collective bargaining in Ontario, I think. Uh, but anyway, so this is, but this is the entire economy. So every sector is covered by these collective contracts. So that's a very important similarity. Here's a, here's a variation I'm beginning to look at. Argentina's real wage growth is 22.5% between 2003 and 2015. Now this, this, is, this is taking into account inflation. So this is actual growth in wages in that period of time. Uruguay saw a 31.5% increase in real wage growth in that period of time. So Uruguay obviously has, Uruguay workers have obviously benefited more from this than Argentinian workers. Now, one of the things I'm interested in is, well, how, does it, how do institution, institutional differences explain variation? Well, the, Argentina has, this is where it gets very complicated, so bear with me. Argentina has a corporatist model, and corporatism means, just to be sim just to simplify, the relationship between the union, the state, and how they relate to each other. Okay, so corporatism is how unions and state relate to each other. In Argentina, the, u the state relates to unions in a statist manner, meaning, this is crucial, that the Argentinian state determines which unions have the right to negotiate. And the Argentinian state, by definition, also has the right to rescind that, um, uh, that recognition. Oh. So that means the Argentinian state has inordinate power over the labor unions. Okay. Uruguay, on the other hand, has what we call a liberal or societal model, which means that the, Ar the Uruguayan state does not have the right or the capacity to choose which labor unions get to negotiate. Okay, this is very important. And this comes from Schmitter's typology of corporatism, which originates from the 1970s, okay? So let's go into the argument and the stylized model that I have. So the first order arguments, this is dealing with the normative concerns I was talking about initially. Labor unions, I argue, are viable in a post-industrial global economy. However, the condition of the success is political. That means that agency matters. Prior to 2003, prior to the French Amplio in Uruguay and Nestor Kirchner in Argentina, the labor unions in both countries were experiencing severe difficulties. Mm -hmm. It's because the political leaders at the time had decided that labor unions were a problem and they wanted to get weakened them. And in Uruguay's case, they almost eliminated them completely. So when new political leaders came into power who were progressive, they purposefully made the labor unions strong. That was one of their uh, objectives. Now, I want to um, put into context, so why does representativeness and inclusiveness matter? So labor union growth is not the best metric of success. So yes, you may have a labor union that grows in membership and becomes very powerful, but if they're not able this is very important to know. If labor unions are not able to be seen as representative or inclusive of their members' interests, it doesn't matter because they're not able to mobilize those workers. Okay? And so this is crucially important. So, for example, you could have a labor union that collects billions of dollars a year, has lots of members, but if the labor leaders are seen as corrupt and also not democratically elected, the, the members themselves will be less likely to support them when they have to go to strike for some reason. Mm -hmm. So that's why inclusiveness and representativeness matters. Here's a second order argument. So this is with the empirical questions I had earlier. So the variation in institutional legacies of the initial period of labor incorporation. So when going back, why do initial period institutional designs matter? Mm -hmm. So this is asking the question of why well, they do matter. So Argentina and Uruguay have very different models of labor incorporation, meaning the state recognizing labor unions as valuable and legitimate members of the, uh, the social uh, complex. 
Argentina had, like I said, a statist approach under Perón, and Uruguay had a liberal approach under Neo Bashifmo. And this explains this variation from the 1940s, and this is very important to note, is that the labor laws from the 1940s are effectively unchanged today. So this is important. Those laws exist, but all these regime changes have occurred. Mm -hmm. And also changes in the political economy. So you have one stable variable while everything else is changing. So the question is, how does that one stable variable explain what we see in the post-neoliberal post period in 2003, right? Okay. So I say that this period is important for comparison as well because it's the first one where both Uruguay and Argentina at the same time have a consolidated liberal democracy coexisting with the corporatist mechanism. Mm -hmm. okay, this is also very important, that for the first time you can actually compare for a meaningful period of time how the control variable is interacting with this um, explanatory variable. So Argentina's illiberal labor institute, this is my argument, okay? So Argentina's illiberal labor institutions are in crisis under liberal democratic conditions. Meanwhile, Uruguay's liberal institutions are thriving under liberal democratic conditions. Okay? So here's, again, the technology of corporatism. So the CGT in, Uruguay, in Argentina, you know, Perón, CGT, this whole mythology, well, what's important to note is that the state that the unions were given their monopoly representation. Remember, it's second level collective bargaining, meaning that only one labor union represents all workers. Mm -hmm. That was that is called personalia gremia in Argentina, mm -hmm. and it was dependently conceded, meaning the state gave it to the workers, gave it to particular unions, to the exception of other unions. Mm -hmm. So you could have one union representing all workers, even though uh, competing unions also represent workers in the same sector. They don't matter. They can negotiate, they can collect um, fees, and they can represent workers at, um, at the level of the firm. So this is something that the state has over these unions. It also gives these unions immense power, but also immense weakness, mm -hmm. right? It's very similar to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mexico is also another example of this, mm -hmm. right? Um, Uruguay, on the other hand, is unique in Latin America. I don't think there's any other country where the monopoly representation of workers occurred independently of the state. So what the Uruguayan state in the 1940s did was say, we will recognize the labor leaders who were elected by all workers in the sector independent of whether or not they belong to the union. I'll say that again. And the Uruguayan state said, we will only recognize labor leaders, mm -hmm. not unions, labor leaders who were elected by all workers in the sector, independent of whether or not they paid dues to the union. Uh, okay. So this guaranteed that the labor movement in Uruguay maintained pluralistic. Meanwhile, in Argentina, the exact opposite. They got rid of all pluralism, and they only took the in power. Okay, so this is very important to know. Uruguay, the labor unions, in the, voluntarily came together in 1966. This is the uh, convención. Mm -hmm where they agreed to create one monopoly union voluntarily and therefore they got monopoly representation by their own efforts okay. and therefore it is seen as legitimate because it was done voluntarily and democratically mm -hmm. while in argentina that monopoly representation was just given to them by the state okay. Okay. so this is Arge this is the conceptual model i'm thinking about Mm -hmm. So Argentina's status corporatist model is a legitimation crisis with both top-down and bottom-up pressures. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first thing is Argentina is facing top-down pressures from the Supreme Court and the ILO. Mm -hmm. The ILO has since the 1990s, since the 1980s, I think actually, has said that Argentina's labor laws are in violation of the ILO charter and they have to change. Mm -hmm. Opposition labor unions in Argentina have gone to the ILO and demanded that the Argentine government change it. The Argentine government has not changed it. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court, this is when it became more serious. It's one thing for its national organization to say, it's another thing for the Supreme Court to say. In, beginning in 2008, the Argentine Supreme Court determined that the, the key parts of that law, of the um, corporatist law, violates the Constitution. Mm -hmm. okay. It violates the liberal principles of the Constitution. In particular, it violates the freedom of, associ of association because it doesn't allow people to freely associate. So this obviously means that the, 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 the 
the Argentine model of labor uh, relations is clearly in crisis because it violates the very principles of liberalism that now the country accepts as uh, basic. Also, the bottom up, the bottom down pressures are very important to note. First off, opposition labor unions are using the judiciary to pressure the state to change the law, right? But there's something else happening. Since 2003, there's been a growth in left-wing activism at the level of the firm, meaning that Marxists, Trotskyites, and other more radical leftist groups at the level of the firm are beginning to challenge the monopoly, um, the, sorry, the labor leaders. They're saying you're illegitimate, you're not democratic, and we don't want to uh, be part of your union. We want to get our own. And so, this, and so what's happening is that uh, labor, this is very crucial to understand because labor leaders, knowing that they're facing these bottom up pressures, want to marginalize these leftist labor leaders at the level of the firm. So how do they do that? How they do that is by offering these particular workers higher salaries than the average. So the less democratic your move, the less democratic your labor movement is under liberal democratic conditions, the more likely that sector that's more combative is going to have higher salaries than the average worker. Right? So this is what's happening in Argentina. And I'll show you in a second how I can actually show that's the case. What's important to note here is that these are interaction effects. Mm -hmm. That these two work together. Right? So you need standing at the court to have a case. Well, who gives you the cases? <laughs> these people do. Mm -hmm. Right? The court then decides against these people. And so the state here has to do something about it. It hasn't done anything yet. Right? But I'll show you in a second. Oh, I didn't work. Uruguay. Well, Uruguay is a different situation. It's equilibrium, positive equilibrium. So, so Uruguay's societal corporatist model is seen as broadly legitimate by all actors. I talk to everyone in Uruguay. <laughs> well, it's a small country. Uh, but I talk to a lot of people in Uruguay, many of the people who are dealing with the unions on a daily basis, with people in many ministries. No one questions the legitimacy and democratic point of view of the Uruguayan movement. Okay. No one. Um, and there are no bottom-up pressures in the way, the same way. No one's questioning whether or not these people are legitimate. No one's questioning whether or not the decisions are in the interest of workers. <laughs> okay. So what's happening in Uruguay is that the actual model is what you would expect. It's almost like a null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. This is what corporate uh, corporatism is supposed to look like. Organized labor, negotiating with the state, the state negotiating with business, and then you get a contract. And the reason why this works as it does is because the labor organization, the labor leaders, are democratically elected by their own workers. And not only that, but many of the labor leaders actually still work at the firm. Mm -hmm. They're not just you know, some bureaucrat who works at you know, the behest of the state. Mm -hmm. Also to note, Argentina's labor leaders, some of them have been in power for 50 years. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody thinks they could be reelected for 50 years. Fidel uh, Velasquez in Mexico probably is yeah, I mean, very close to more than 50 bucks. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously, no one thinks these, no one really thinks these labor leaders are um, democratically elected. And yesterday, Macri said that he's going to go against the mafiosos syndicalism. Mm -hmm. So we're beginning something very. So what this means is that the Argentine unions are much weaker than Perón intended them to be. Because Perón intended this model to exist in a non-liberal democratic model, uh, system of government. I don't agree with you in that point. Okay. <laughs> so here we have a show of the actual evidence that suggests that my um, conclusion at least can be supported empirically. So this is a change in inequality of salaried workers. What this means is the following. Salaried workers are formal sector workers who make a salary. So these workers are the ones who are covered under collective bargaining. <laughs> Using data from 2006 to 2014, you can see that, that, that let me explain very quickly. What, it, it, I assume people know what Gini means, but I'll say it anyway. It's the distribution, it's the difference between the lowest and the highest. So one meaning that it's absolute inequality means every, only one person has all the wealth. Zero means everyone shares wealth equally. So what this shows is that in Argentina, in the same period of time, the distribution of uh, income in terms of differentials has decreased, it has, 
But in Uruguay, it decreased by 40% more. Okay. What this suggests is that there's a lot more coordination and a lot more uh, consistency in the negotiations in Uruguay than in Argentina. What this suggests to me is that in Argentina, those sectors which are more combative are able to get higher salary increases in the average. And as a result, it means that our Uruguay is actually fulfilling much closer to what collective bargaining is supposed to do. It's supposed to reduce inequality and create uh, social justice. Mm -hmm. And so in Argentina's case, there has been a decrease in inequality, of course, but that decrease is not what Uruguay has done. And one of the reasons is because Uruguay's model is just much more attuned to what liberal democratic forms want. So if you want a strong labor movement, you need to be inclusive and representative. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to be powerful okay. in, under liberal democratic conditions. Mm -hmm. So here's my conclusion. First, unions are viable in a post-industrial globalized context. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen is that political leaders need to have the ability to say, we want strong unions. Mm -hmm. Third, a second, sorry, unions thrive when they're democratic and representative. <coughs> Because if you have democratic and representative unions, it means that the workers believe that your workers are fighting for their interests and they're willing to fight for you mm -hmm. as well. Labor institutions and policy condition, sorry, labor institutions and policy condition the role of organized labor, labor, meaning institutions also matter. That how those institutions are designed creates incentives which are very different for labor leaders. The consolidation of liberal democracy can and has do, and does have important effects on economic performance. I think this is another important uh, conclusion of mine. And that human rights norms, the diffusion of democracy to civil society, and the entrance of minorities into the workforce, including women and youth, challenge the legacies of corporatism. I didn't, go, I didn't talk about this very much because I've only gone forever. But <laughs> my, Argentina and Uruguay has seen a very large increase in the amount of women working and the amount of young people working. Correct. And what this means is, is that traditional mechanisms of control are not working as they used to, mm -hmm. right? When you have a patriarchal workplace, it's one thing. It's quite another thing when you're trying to convince women and young people that this is in their interest, right? Mm -hmm. So Argentina is facing difficulty in addressing these questions, and Uruguay appears not to be. And to finish, the ILO, not the ILO, well, the ILO, the head of the ILO has called Uruguay the model case of collective bargaining and social dialogue in the world. Mm. It's not just the new Latin America, it's the world. Uh. And Argentina is not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So there's my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, if any yeah, questions, I guess. If you want. Yeah. So you had a question for Charlie? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Charlie. Charles. Charlie. Sorry. Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. It's not Charlie. <laughs> okay. I got three questions for you. Y te las voy a decir en español así practicas. Okay. Okay. Venga. ¿Qué fue lo que te llevó a elegir Colombia y otro país de Sudamérica o Centroamérica? Primera pregunta. Segundo. Siendo Colombia tan grande, ¿por qué elegiste Arauca y Montes de María? Y tercero, ¿tu tesis la vas a publicar o la vas a realizar también en español? La primera, eh, porque Colombia, hace cinco o seis años, yo viví en Venezuela. Yo era un profe en una, una universidad de Arte, la Universidad de Los Andes. Entonces, se volvió muy cerca de, de Colombia también, como cinco horas o en el carro. Entonces, resulté que yo pasé mucho tiempo entre los dos países. Entonces, cuando llegué a, a la universidad de acá, con Ana María, pues mi pro, primer proyecto iba a ser un, un estudio comparativo entre Colombia y Venezuela. Uh -huh. Pero debido a las cosas que estaban dando en, en, en Venezuela en ese momento, a, a lo largo de los últimos cinco años o algo, yo decidí que yo preferiría enfocar en Colombia. Okay. Realmente yo preferiría hacer investigación, trabajo en el campo en un lugar como Arauca, que es la cuna de la familia, que Caracas. Okay. Porque Venezuela es, es muy insegura y también no se puede dialogar, entrevistar para nada o con, o con la clase política venezolana, porque todo es una, no sé, como es una farsa realmente. Entonces, por eso yo llegué y también la influencia de Ana María uh -huh. en mi proyecto, por eso estoy enfocando en Colombia. ¿Por qué esos dos casos de estudios? Porque Uribe 
implementó la misma política contra el sujeto al mismo tiempo, la misma fecha más o menos, en los dos casos, y después, digamos que la política de seguridad democrática se, se expandió a lugares como La Macarena, Cundinamarca, Cauca, Chocó, por todo el país, pero los dos laboratorios se encontraron en Arauca y los Monte de María y también la variación entre los, los resultados. Porque, pues les digo en ese momento, Arauca, el Pierre Monte hasta hoy, pues el Estado está, la, las fuerzas militares, pero no salen de, de sus barajas. Entonces, es, son lugares muy pesados. Mientras tanto, la, la Sahara, el Monte de María, no, no se encuentra en Perú. Okay. Entonces, a la tercera, se va a publicar. Ojalá. <laughs> <laughs> In Spanish? Yes, sí, I imagine. Sí. Okay. Gracias. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, really interesting work. I was curious sort of, um, in, in your emphasis on the, the particularity of those particular regions, right, and the fact that Uribe did choose them as his laboratories, right, that how you see um, the project in relation to Colombia as a national model. Right, so to what extent can you take your findings and uh, say that this is reflective of something that we can see happening on a larger national scale? Mm -hmm. Or in what, in what areas would you then have to say, you know, this is really just because Montezemani is, 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 has these very particular features? I think the, the strength, originally I was only going to compare the uh, municipalities in Arauca because you find the, the, the disparity in results amongst those municipalities. However, uh, a couple people, uh, when I was in the stage of developing this, they, they kept asking me, well, if we established those, uh, if he established, I'm going to explain those shoes. If he established two zones of re rehabilitation and consolidation, mm -hmm. how are you going to justify not including the other, especially the other so clearly? Yeah, yeah. So clearly there was that, uh, that, that you know, disparity in result. Like, because Montes de Maria is one of the few cases where you can say, but uh, would it be small? It, it worked, but it was also it owed a massive debt to the brutality of the paramilitary person there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, uh, often the two cases, uh, a, a guy who works for WOLA at the uh, Washington office on Latin America, was Columbia's appointment, he told me that, well, his perception of uh, the uh, Uribe strategy in both these, uh, in both these regions is that it could be characterized as that the ELN one in Arauca, mm -hmm. whereas paramilitary is one. So how applicable is that to other regions of the country? I think the historical con the historical configuration, you have to look at these factors, how these, you know, especially from a class-based perspective, how is it that uh, the, you know, this fronts from the same guerrilla organizations are able to gain traction and gain you know, public trust and uh, embed themselves? Are they able to prevent people, even if they don't control the territory, from defecting the state? Whereas in others, there's not much, uh, there's not much appreciation about them, and you really have to look at uh, who, whose interests tru uh, truly predominate in a, in a given territory. So whereas uh, you tend to find that Col Colombia is one of the most unequal countries on the face of the earth, the, the land distribution is outrageous, but areas where uh, large landholders, um, there's a large landholding class uh, exists, their 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 interests predominate. They supersede those of local local peasants. So it's not you know they're one of the strongest alliances between uh, paramilitarism, the paramilitary project there was for cattle ranchers. Any region with as large, uh, you know, there was a substantial presence of cattle ranchers, they allied right away. Once they had the opportunity to invite paramilitaries to come into the regions, because they were being extorted by the guerrillas. So regions where you don't have those elites, I find that uh, you can find the same level of uh, embeddedness, if you will. So I, I think I'd like to, my, my, I, my what I'm thinking of doing right now is doing a postdoc where I've expanded one more case mm -hmm. to test out this model in Colombia and uh, perhaps also find another cross uh, an international case study from another country and perhaps you know, Asia and Africa to yeah. examine the viability of it. Yeah. No, very interesting. I mean, it, it occurs to me that Uribe, you can imagine he was thinking as he set up to do these laboratory models, right, that um, we'll first do these two, these two regions, I should say, and then if it works well, we'll take what we found and we'll apply it elsewhere, and I'll be the great you know, champion. But, I mean, clearly he was uh, you know, trying to first do a model and then apply it elsewhere. But it seems like your work is, is showing that the particularity of the regions doesn't allow for that kind of... Well, some do, some don't. Yeah, yeah. Monte de Marillo is one of the only regions where the guerrillas were effectively defeated. Mm -hmm. You go there today, you know, there's 
whispers up in very distant communities that there's unknown people still coming through. But in terms of them wearing their uniforms, having camp, you know, pretty much interacting. Uh,